Hi everyone, welcome back to this online short course on incentives in computer science. Uh, and congratulations, you've reached the last module, the sixth module. Uh, last but not least, we will be talking about Bitcoin, uh, the most uh, world's most famous blockchain, the world's most famous uh, cryptocurrency. So an exciting topic uh, on which there's still lots that we don't understand. But let's start with some of the stuff that we do understand, namely just how the Bitcoin protocol works. So digital currencies, they've been prototyped actually for a long time, for many decades, but it's really just the last 10 years, just this last decade, uh, that they've really sort of taken off. And the first one uh, that really kind of you know, grew and, and gained large scale adoption uh, is the Bitcoin protocol. Um, now, you maybe have heard of some other cryptocurrencies as well, like maybe Ethereum. Much of what we'll say will also uh, be relevant for those other cryptocurrencies. But let me just keep the um, discussion concrete and let's just talk about the most famous of the cryptocurrencies, uh, namely Bitcoin. So what is the point of Bitcoin? The point is to enable digital payments uh, between parties who do not trust each other. Now, this in and of itself is not so impressive. You know, we didn't need um, a digital currency like Bitcoin to solve this problem. You know, for example, you know, systems like PayPal or Venmo, they already enable two parties who don't necessarily trust each other directly. They allow them to transact because PayPal asks, acts as a, as a trusted intermediary uh, in a transfer of funds from one of the untrusted parties to the other. So the point of a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin is to enable uh, digital payments between untrusted parties without any centralized authority, without any point of trust analogous to uh, PayPal or Venmo or a credit card company or a government, nothing. Literally nobody's trusted and yet still you're going to wind up with secure payments uh, from one untrusted party to another. So this is a much more ambitious goal and indeed until Bitcoin came along uh, to about 10 years ago, it really was not clear that this was possible at a large scale. Uh, so that's a big deal that in the last decade, we've realized that actually this can be done uh, at scale. So your next question might be, well, like, why does anybody want this? Like, uh, like what problem is this solving? Uh, and to be honest, you know, the killer application of blockchains and, you know, Bitcoin specifically, it's, it's a little bit still, the jury is still out. It's not totally clear. Just to put that in context, I mean, let me remind you that uh, the Internet has been around a long time. Okay, so the first version of the Internet called the ARPANET uh, dates back to the late 60s. Uh, whereas, meanwhile, the World Wide Web, that came along only around 1990, 23 years later. And then it was another five years before you had, you know, good browsers that really made the World Wide Web uh, sort of uh, become very popular. So it was 25 plus years after the invention of the internet that you had sort of all of the killer applications that we think about. You did at the beginning you know, of, the, of the internet already have things like email and file transfer. Um, and so maybe the analog of those early applications for Bitcoin uh, would be that of a uh, cheap and fast international money transfer. So currently, you know, if, you, if the normal way, the traditional way of doing a wire transfer between different countries uh, is you go to your bank, your bank talks to their bank, you know, at some point the money gets wired to that bank and then finally it goes to the person you actually want the funds to go to. Um, and usually, usually you have to pay for an international wild tran transfer, like $20 would be kind of a, a standard fee for an international money transfer. And you also usually have to wait a while, like multiple days. And so with Bitcoin, on the other hand, you can do that same transfer uh, without using any banks. Uh, and you're going to save about an order of magnitude, both in you know what the transaction fee that you're going to have to pay, um, and in the delay before the funds uh, are received by the other party. So you know that's nice. Is that going to change the world? Maybe not, but that's kind of the, an, an initial prosaic uh, application of Bitcoin. And in recent years, many, many, many different uh, proposed applications are out there. We'll see which ones really take off. You know, at this moment, of, at the moment of this recording in late July, uh, so-called DeFi or decentralized finance, that's what's all the rage now. There's tons of people trying to get uh, financial instruments on blockchains. We'll see if that takes off. If not that, maybe it'll be something else. You know, it's early days, which makes it kind of very exciting, but also a little hard to predict exactly how uh, things are going to unfold. Now let's stop speculating about the future and let's return to something concrete, which is, you know, Bitcoin and how it actually operates. Uh, so the key primitive in Bitcoin is the notion of a transaction, you know, which is really a transfer of funds from one party to another. 
So let me tell you about the ingredients in a Bitcoin transaction. I'm going to talk about those ingredients kind of in a conceptual level. I'm not going to worry about sort of nitty gritty implementation details. So first of all, you need to know who's sending the funds and who is receiving the funds. So you have a sender and a receiver. So it turns out you can actually have multiple senders and multiple receivers if you want. Let's just sort of ignore that detail. Let's just for simplicity, think of a transfer as being from you know, one party, the sender to another party, the receiver. So how do you specify who the sender and receiver are? Well, in Bitcoin, you do not write down your name or your social security number or anything else which could uh, link um, your Bitcoin account to a real world identity. Rather on Bitcoin, users are identified only through sort of a long inscrutable sequence of bits, sequence of zeros and ones, uh, which is called the user's public key. So the term public key comes from cryptography. I'll say more about that uh, sort of at the bottom of this slide, but for now, just imagine you know that everybody has their own unique name, which is just a sequence of zeros and ones um, that, while unique to you, has no obvious link to any real-world identity. For the moment, just think of a public key as a as a long sequence of uh, unique zeros and ones. So a transaction, of course, you know you're transferring funds, so you should also specify exactly how much funds you're transferring. Uh, and now for a Bitcoin transaction, you know, what are those funds? Those funds are in the native currency. They're in the currency of Bitcoins. And so when you're talking about the currency of Bitcoin, uh, the abbreviation is BTC. You know, so just like you'd use USD for a US dollar, you use BTC to talk about, uh, to talk about the number of Bitcoins involved. There are exchanges out there where you can um, trade in your Bitcoins for US dollars or vice versa. Uh, so at any given time, you know, if you look at the exchanges, there's some going price for what a Bitcoin costs. Uh, as you may have heard, that's been very volatile over the years. It's been all over the place. Uh, at the time of this recording, which is in late July 2020, um, Bitcoin's been hovering around $10,000 per Bitcoin. Uh, I don't know when you're going to be watching this, but whenever it is, I wouldn't be surprised if that 10,000 had turned into 5,000 or if that 10,000 had turned into 20,000. Really uh, have no idea how that's going to go. But at the moment, they're around 10,000. Um, and if you're thinking that, whoa, it's kind of weird if you can only send people um, funds that are in multiples of $10,000, um, you, you can split a Bitcoin up into little pieces. So in fact, the, the primitive currency unit is something known as a Satoshi. Uh, and it's, I believe, 10 to the 18 Satoshis make up uh, make up a Bitcoin. Uh, why Satoshi? Well, um, that relates to the alleged inventor of Bitcoin. Uh, so it's actually a big worldwide mystery uh, who the inventor of Bitcoin is. There's some mysterious figure known by Satoshi Nakamoto who published the white paper uh, describing Bitcoin back in 2009 and also uh, you know, wrote the software and put it out there uh, for people to use. And nobody knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is. It may be one person, it may be multiple, multiple people. Uh, you know, if you search around the internet, you can find lists of who speculated to maybe be Satoshi Nakamoto, um, but we don't know. But anyways, that's, that's why the smallest unit of, of, uh, of Bitcoins is called a Satoshi, after the, after the unknown inventor. So next, the sender has to justify that they really do possess the funds that they are that they are aiming to transfer uh, to the receiver. So they need a proof of funds. And the way they prove they have the funds is they point to some previous transactions, spending those exact same coins and giving it to the sender. So the sender says, I'm sending you know, one Bitcoin and that Bitcoin is the Bitcoin that I was paid in this transaction in the past. And then the final ingredient, which will probably become increasingly important uh, with time, but now you know, we can largely ignore for this lecture, uh, is there's a transaction fee. And this transaction fee is paid from the sender uh, to whoever it is who authorizes this transaction. And we'll say a lot more about uh, who uh, authorizes transactions and how do they do it. But that's what the transaction fee is for. The sender says, hey, you know, transaction authorizer, this is, uh, this is something I'll pay you uh, for you doing the work of uh, authorizing the transaction. Now, in Bitcoin, it's important to check that transactions are legitimate, that they're valid. So, for example, you know, that the sender really is spending coins that they own. So, validity of a, tra of a transaction, it involves various things. So, you know, it has to be formatted just so, according to the specifications of the protocol. Um, but what's interesting for us is that um, to be valid, a transaction, you know, first of all, it has to be cryptographically signed by the sender of the coins. Uh, and secondly, it should check out. 
uh, that the sender still, you know, still owns the coins that it's uh, purporting to send right now. Let me elaborate on each of these two points a little bit. So first, the first one, that it must be cryptographically signed by the sender. So what does that even mean? Um, so I mentioned earlier this notion of a public key associated with each uh, Bitcoin account, which is this big sequence of zeros and ones. Um, so actually what each Bitcoin user has is they have a pair consisting of, on the one hand, a public key, and on the other hand, a secret key. The secret key, as, you, as it suggests, that's known only to the user themselves. That's something they do not publicize. They don't share that with anybody. Whereas the public key is something you can go ahead and like post on the web. That's something you want uh, everybody to know. And these two keys are coupled. And um, through the magic of cryptography, uh, you can, you can uh, implement what are known as di digital, digital signatures. So for example, you know, if I generate a, a coupled public secret key for myself, um, and then there's some electronic message, you know, so I, I'm saying, you know, making some promise and I want to, you know, sign it so that everybody would be convinced that, yes, it was really me who made that promise. Then there's something called a uh, digital signature, which allows me to append to the statement of the promise, a bunch of gobbledygook. So it's again, it's going to be a bunch of zeros and ones tacked onto the end uh, of the message that I'm send it's sending. And uh, that's going to be the signed version of this of this message. So it's going to be the message plus the gobbledygook. Now, you know what prevents someone else from just you know impersonating me and and sort of alleging that I signed this thing I didn't actually sign? Uh, well, here's the thing: anyone else using my public key, and again, my public key is just posted on the web. Anyone else can use my public key and verify that indeed I did use my secret key to generate that gobbledygook. I did use my secret key to generate those zeros and ones that are tacked onto the end of the message. And at that point, you can safely conclude that I really did sign the message. Or if not, it's because someone stole my secret key. But as long as I'm the only one who knows the secret key, I'm the only one who could have generated that particular idiosyncratic gobbledygook, and you can be convinced as such just using uh, my public key. I'm not gonna talk at all about how to implement this. That's so it's some beautiful computer science, but that's worthy of its own course. So maybe. Uh, someday you'll take a cryptography course and you'll you'll learn about the really cool usually number theory uh, behind how these are done so this is really important that these cryptographic signatures because these these prevent someone from forging a transaction in your name right so if i don't know your secret key i am incapable of generating uh some transfer uh, that looks to be signed by you i just can't do it so um, i cannot forge transactions on your behalf so that's extremely important um, secondly, of course, even, you know, if once I am convinced that, you know, the claimed sender in the transaction is in fact the actual sender, even once I know that from verifying the, the digital signature, uh, I still need to check that you have that much money in your balance, just like you would, you know, when anybody writes a personal check, uh, kind of in the real world. But with the way Bitcoin works, it turns out it's sort of easy to verify that people have the funds that they're trying to send. And the reason is, is because literally every transaction ever in Bitcoin is broadcast to everybody. Okay, so there's a big peer to peer network. Remember, we talked a little bit about peer to peer networks. We were talking about BitTorrent in the Prisoner's Dilemma module back in module number two. So there's a peer to peer network. There's sort of thousands of computers. They're all talking to each other all the time. Uh, and everybody tells everybody about every single transaction. So there's just 100% knowledge about every transaction that's ever happened in the past. It sounds like it's sort of a lot. It is. It's currently around, I think, 200 gigabytes and growing. Um, but, you know, that's something all of these computers participating in the Peter Pin network are keeping track of. So everybody knows the entire history of all transactions in the world. And so then, of course, from that, you can deduce everybody's current balance. And from that, you can deduce whether or not a given uh, transaction is valid, whether or not the balance of the user, of the sender, is in fact uh, high enough that they can get away with transferring uh, what they're trying to transfer to the receiver. So that's what we mean by a transaction being valid. Okay? It really is being sent by who the alleged sender is, uh, and that sender really does have the coins in their bank account uh, or in their Bitcoin account um, that, that they want to send to that receiver. And it's kind of funny, actually, because um, peer-to-peer networks, they were sort of a really hot area in computer science uh, in the early 21st century. Um, and they certainly have applications. We talked about BitTorrent and sort of peer-to-peer -peer file transfer, and there's other applications as well. You know, but now, like from the vantage point of 2020, it kind of seems that, you know, cryptocurrencies might actually be the true killer application uh, of peer-to-peer -peer networks. And again, they're used in Bitcoin to make sure everybody's on the same page as far as what all the transactions are. So that's what you need to know about transactions 
Next, I want to tell you about how these transactions are sequenced, which will bring us to the blockchain.